Welcome to our first exciting episode of The Quran in Context. How many times has this happened? Your Muslim friends tell you that Islam is a religion of peace. Every news program you watch says over and over and over that Islam is a religion of peace. Politicians assure you that Islam is a religion of peace. And you sit back and think to yourself, surely so many voices mindlessly reciting the exact same politically correct nonsense must be telling the truth. It's a tough pill to swallow, but nothing you can't wash down with the proverbial Kool-Aid. So, you commit intellectual suicide, and you start saying things like, but all religions have their radical elements, and how can we judge an entire religion based on the actions of a tiny minority of extremists? Then one day you're watching an old public enemy video, and you learn yet another valuable life lesson from the only rapper in the world who can still rock a Viking helmet. Hey yo, check this out! Just to all of those people, man, you know what I'm saying? Who be, you be believing lies. We call those lies hype, you know what I'm saying? So I got to tell you one thing. Don't believe the hype! Now you're feeling a little concerned, a little scared, a little disillusioned. Could Flavor Flav be right about people believing lies? No! No! Could the media be biased in their reporting? No! Could Muslims be practicing taqiyya? No! Could politicians be cowards who care more about re-election than about truth or integrity? No! Could all this talk about Islam being a religion of peace perhaps be nothing but hype? Yeah, boy! There's only one way to find out, so you decide to do something risky, something crazy, something that might ruin your reputation forever, causing Muslim organizations like CARE and ISNA to label you a racist, Islamophobic, hate-mongering bigot. You decide to actually read the Muslim sources, the Quran and the Hadith. And when you do, what do you find? Oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends, they are friends of each other. Fight those who believe not in Allah. O oh, Prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden, a fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you, and let them find in you hardness. Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when ye should be uppermost. Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are, are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah. Muhammad said, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. The Prophet said, whoever dies without having fought or having thought of fighting, he dies on one of the branches of hypocrisy. The Messenger of Allah said, whoever meets Allah with no mark on him as a result of fighting in his cause, he will meet him with a deficiency. Allah's Messenger said, if anyone changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. All right, move on. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Nothing to see here. Hmm. Killing apostates, violently subjugating unbelievers, slaying and getting slain. Not what you'd expect from a religion of peace, tolerance, and candy-coated raindrops. So you bring a few of these passages to your Muslim friends, and you ask them why they've been claiming that Islam promotes diversity and interfaith harmony when the Muslim sources are filled with calls for violence, oppression, and cruelty. That's when your Muslim friends teach you a little magic trick context. By appealing to context, Muslims can snap their fingers and make all of the Quran's violent teachings disappear. Watch carefully as Muslim congressman slash Islamic magician Keith Ellison demonstrates the trick. Let's use this point for a moment. Because as you know, as a student of religion, you know, you can, their books are complex, they're compiled, uh, and, and, and taking them out of context is a very easy thing to do. Want to see it again? Congressman Ellison, what about all the Muslims who carried out more than 18,000 terrorist attacks since 9-11? Like any ideologue, they will take things out of context to do what they want to do. Context? Context. Context. 
Context. Context. Context. Context. Context. Context. Can you explain what this context was? Context. 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 Jihad, ladies and gentlemen, now you see it. Context. 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 Now you don't. So here's the story. All those violent passages you read in the Quran and the Hadith commanding Muslims to subjugate or kill non-Muslims, you've taken them out of context. There's some context that makes fight those who do not believe in Allah, and if anyone changes his Islamic religion, then kill him, entirely peaceful. And if you only knew this context, you'd see that Islam is as peaceful as a baby smurf napping on a bed of puppy love wrapped in a warm ray of sunshine. That's the claim, anyway. And there are two main reasons the context defense is so common. One, lots of westernized Muslims really believe that Islam is a religion of peace. And so, when they hear a violent passage from the Quran or the Hadith, they assume there must be some context that justifies the passage, even if they have absolutely no clue what that context might be. Two, even Muslims who know that Islam promotes violence and intolerance also know that most people don't have the relevant books or the time to examine the context and to respond to the claim. So they know they can get away with inventing some imaginary context that supposedly justifies Islam's violent commands. But these contextual illusionists didn't count on your good friend D. Wood showing up to the magic show. No, God, please, no, 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 no! Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read a violent verse from the Quran, Surah 929, and we're going to examine the context of the verse. Now, when Muslims tell us that context exonerates the Quran, they might have a few different things in mind, because there are different kinds of context. First, there's the historical context, what was happening when a verse or a passage was revealed. Was the verse meant just for that time, or was it meant for all times? Was it meant for a particular person, or was it meant for all believers? The historical background can often shed some crucial light on the meaning of a text. Second, there's the immediate context of a verse. The immediate context refers to other verses in the same passage. Do they change the meaning of the verse in question? Sometimes taking a verse out of its immediate context completely changes the meaning. So we read the entire passage to make sure we're not misinterpreting the verse. Third, there's what we'll call the extended literary context. One of the most basic rules of scripture interpretation is that we interpret scripture with other scripture. We consider the book as a whole. If the meaning of a verse is in dispute, we can ask ourselves, what does the rest of the book teach about this issue? Is my interpretation of the verse consistent with other passages that discuss the same topic? So there are different kinds of context, and all of them, might affect the meaning of a verse. Now, we're going to read Surah 929 of the Quran, and we're going to examine the historical context, the immediate context, and the extended literary context. And we'll see what kind of impact these contexts have on our interpretation of the verse. If you use the cut and paste approach, I bet you, you can prove anything you want from any scripture you want. Surah 929 reads, Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day. Notice it doesn't say fight people who attack you. It says fight those who believe not in Allah. Nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. So if you don't forbid the same things that Islam forbids, such as eating pork, Muslims are commanded to fight you. Nor acknowledge the religion of truth, if you don't acknowledge that Islam is superior. From among the people of the book, the people of the book are Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, until we pay tribute to Muslim leaders, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. That doesn't sound very peaceful and tolerant. It sounds like a clear command to Muslims to fight anyone who doesn't believe the same things Muslims believe. It's out of context! Since Surah 929 is clear, Muslims are going to have a bit of trouble reinterpreting it. Why? 
because the Quran claims to be clear and perfect as is. Consider a few verses. Surah 6, verse 114. Shall I seek for a judge other than Allah when he it is who has sent down to you the book fully explained? 11.1. One. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection and then they have been expounded in detail. 12.1. These are verses of the clear book. 16.89. And we have sent down to thee the book explaining all things. 27.1. These are verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. 41.3. A book whereof the verses are explained in detail. 57.9. He it is who sends down clear communications upon his servant, that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. Allah says that the Quran is clear, firm, free from imperfection, fully explained, expounded in detail. It explains all things. And this already rules out some of the standard Muslim reinterpretations. For instance, Muslims in the West tell us that when Allah says, fight those who do not believe, he actually means fight people who are attacking you. But if Allah had meant fight people who are attacking you, he would have said fight people who are attacking you because the Quran is perfectly clear. In other words, if Allah meant something different from what he said, then the Quran isn't clear, it isn't free from imperfection, it isn't fully explained, it isn't expounded in detail. According to the Quran, Allah says exactly what he means. And what does the Quran say? Fight those who do not believe. But Muslims want to reinterpret verses like this, and for some reason they're convinced that context will help them. So let's turn to the context of Surah 929. And we'll start with the historical context. His, what was the historical context of this ayat that speaks sternly about killing the unbelievers? Islam's greatest commentator of all time, Ibn Kathir, describes the historical context for us. I'll just read what he said in the Battles of the Prophet. Allah, Most High, ordered the believers to prohibit the disbelievers from entering or coming near the sacred mosque, so non-Muslims were no longer allowed to take the pilgrimage to the Kaaba in Mecca. On that, Quraysh, that's Muhammad's tribe, thought that this would reduce their profits from trade. Therefore, Allah Most High compensated them and ordered them to fight the people of the book until they embrace Islam or pay the jizya. If they embrace Islam, they'll be paying zakat. If they don't embrace Islam, they'll have to pay the jizya. Either way, money starts rolling in. Allah says, O ye who believe, truly the pagans are unclean, so let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if ye fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. That was Surah 928 to 29. Therefore, the messenger of Allah decided to fight the Romans in order to call them to Islam. Why did Muhammad decide to fight the Romans? Because they were attacking him? They weren't. Muhammad decided to fight the Romans because he was commanded to fight them in Surah 929. And what was the historical context of Surah 929? The people of Muhammad's tribe were worried about how they were going to make money. In the past, they had made a ton of money from polytheists coming to their city. But now that Muhammad was in charge, the polytheists were no longer allowed to take their religious pilgrimage to Mecca. So the Quraysh wanted to know how they were going to pay their bills. Allah answered, you're going to make money by fighting the Jews and Christians. They'll gladly pay you to avoid being killed. And Muhammad went out to fight the Romans. Surah 929, not according to me, according to Muslim sources, is a money-making scheme. Fight people until they pay you. Jews and Christians are a source of income. Now, think about this for a moment. What kind of person would I be 
If my wife comes up to me and says, David, how are we going to pay our electric bill this month? And I say, well, give me my baseball bat. I'll go beat some people up and make them give me their wallets. Is that normal? Maybe for criminals, but that's exactly how Allah responds when Muslims start worrying about money. He tells them to go out and fight people to get money from them. And what does the word of God say? That it says that there are only two conditions that you can go to the battlefield. That's the proper intention. Self-defense or against tyranny and oppression. There is no third reason that I can point to. How's that context working out so far, my Muslim friends? The historical context didn't help, but maybe the immediate context of the passage will show that Surah 929 is entirely peaceful. This section of the Quran begins at verse 28, which we already read in Ibn Kathir's commentary, but let's go ahead and begin again at verse 28 and keep reading until verse 33, where the passage ends. O oh, ye who believe, truly the pagans are unclean, so let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if ye fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Now, watch how this is all connected. Allah says he's going to enrich the Muslims. How is he going to do this? Next verse, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. But wait a minute, Allah, aren't Jews and Christians the people of the book? Haven't they received true revelations? Aren't they believers? Why are we going to fight them? Next verse, the Jews call Uzair a son of God, and the Christians call Christ the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth. In this, they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say, Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. So we're going to fight the Jews and Christians based on what they believe. Have they done anything else? Next verse. They take their priests and their anchorites to be their lords in derogation of Allah. And they take as their Lord Christ, the son of Mary. Yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. Praise and glory to him. Far is he from having the partners they associate with him. Wow, with all these false beliefs, it's almost as if Jews and Christians are at war with Allah, isn't it? Next verse, fain would they extinguish Allah's light with their mouths. Notice it says with their mouths, not by the sword. This is referring to what we say. But Allah will not allow but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Allah won't allow Jews and Christians to spread their false beliefs through preaching. How is he going to stop them? Next verse, it is he who hath sent his messenger, Muhammad, with guidance and the religion of truth, Islam, to prevail it over all religion, even though the pagans may detest it. Allah will put an end to the spread of false Jewish and Christian beliefs by making Islam prevail over them. How is Islam going to prevail? 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Now, that's the entire passage. It's pretty clear, isn't it? This would be a good time to ask our Muslim friends, based on the immediate context which we just read, why are Muslims commanded to fight Jews and Christians? Because of our beliefs, right? That's certainly how your greatest commentators have interpreted this clear passage. In Ibn Kathir's commentary on 930, we read, Fighting the Jews and Christians is legislated because they are idolaters and disbelievers. Allah the Exalted encourages the believers to fight the polytheists, disbelieving Jews and Christians who uttered this terrible statement and utter lies against Allah the Exalted. As for the Jews, they claim that Uzair was the Son of God. Allah is free of what they attribute to him. As for the misguidance of the Christians over Isa, it is obvious. 
Ibn Kathir says that fighting the Jews and Christians is legislated because they are idolaters and disbelievers. Where on earth did he get that idea? That's what the Quran says. So we're right back to Muslims fighting unbelievers simply for being unbelievers. The immediate context only supports the obvious meaning of Surah 929. The Quran itself uh, guarantees the freedom of every individual to have their faith and to practice it. But we still have to consider the extended literary context. What about other passages of the Quran? Surah 2, 256 says there is no compulsion in religion. Surah 109, verse 6 says, To you be your religion and to me be my religion. These verses are peaceful. How on earth can anyone suggest that 929 is commanding Muslims to fight people because of their beliefs, when the Quran is so tolerant of other people's beliefs. There's actually a simple solution here. The Quran lays down its own method of interpretation in Surah 2, 106, where Allah says, Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? Here we have the principle of abrogation. In Islam, if you have two verses that seem to contradict each other, all you have to do is figure out which one came last, and that's the one that still applies. The earlier verse has been abrogated or canceled. So assuming you have a reliable timeline, it's fairly easy to resolve certain conflicts in the Quran. Now, the Quran says there is no compulsion in religion, in Surah 2. It also says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. In Surah 9, there's a conflict here. Which Surah came last? The Quran isn't arranged chronologically, so we'll have to turn to the Hadith to find out. Sahih al-Bukhari 4364 declares, The last complete Surah which was revealed to the Prophet was Bara. Surah al-Bara is one of the names of Surah 9. It was the last chapter of the Quran that Muhammad delivered to his followers. Some Muslim sources say the same thing about Surah 110, but that's only uh, a few verses. The Muslim sources agree that Surah 9 was at least the last major Surah revealed. And so, uh, if it conflicts with anything that came before it, what came before it was abrogated. So, how does the extended literary context affect our interpretation of Surah 9? Well, the rest of the Quran tells us that whatever comes last abrogates earlier revelations. Surah 9 was the last major surah revealed, which means it contains Muhammad's final marching orders for Muslims. This means that earlier revelations that westernized Muslims like better can't overrule Allah's clear commands in Surah 9. And in this Quran, it clearly states that you are not a believer until you have made Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a judge in the matters where you in dispute. Where does that leave us? The Quran commands Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah. And the Quran claims to be perfectly clear. So it means exactly what it says. But Muslims assure us that if we read the command in context, we'll realize that it's entirely peaceful. We looked at the historical context. Muhammad's followers wanted to know how they were going to make money. The answer from Allah was that they would make money by subjugating Jews and Christians. When Muhammad received this revelation, he launched an offensive campaign against the Roman Empire. We looked at the immediate context and we saw that all the reasons listed for fighting the Jews and Christians had to do with religious beliefs and practices. There wasn't a single word about Jews and Christians attacking anyone. Offensive jihad against non-Muslims is based on the beliefs of non-Muslims. Finally, we examined the extended literary context and we learned that the violent teachings of Surah 9 abrogate or cancel any earlier revelations that call for some degree of peace and tolerance. Muhammad's final marching orders were to fight and subjugate non-Muslims. So where's the context that supposedly makes this verse peaceful? It doesn't exist. Seems like Muslim apologists have been writing checks the facts can't cash. 
Reading Surah 929 in context only shows how obviously violent the passage is. Why do Muslims tell us otherwise? Every opportunity to avoid fighting was followed by the Prophet. There is no question. The idea of pluralism, the coexistence of people of a variety of faiths, is actually enshrined in the Quran. Well, there's one more context we haven't considered. The context of the Muslims who are telling us about Islam. Most Muslims in the West believe that Islam is peaceful and tolerant. Why do they believe that? It can't be because of what the Quran teaches. We've seen what the Quran teaches. Muslims in the West believe that Islam is peaceful because the Quran isn't the only influence on these Muslims. Muslims are influenced by all kinds of things, by their families, by their teachers, by their friends, by the music they listen to and the shows they watch, by their genetics. Many Muslims are raised to believe in the same values I believe in. So they believe these values are good, and then they read these values, Western values, into their religion, even though their religion can't support these values. This is why Muslims in the West tend to live far better lives than their religion commands them to live. But what about Muslims who know the truth about Islam? They tell us that Islam is peaceful when they know it isn't. Why? because Islam allows them to deceive non-Muslims in order to protect Islam and the Muslim community, and because they want to make Islam attractive to people who believe in peace and tolerance. Telling people the truth about Muhammad's teachings is only going to repel people from Islam. That's not good dawah. It turns out, then, that context does play an important role in our discussion, not in showing that Islam is peaceful, but in showing why Muslims want to convince us that it's peaceful. Muslims in America and Europe have grown up in a Western context, and they've either absorbed Western values, or they want to pretend that Islam shares these values in order to attract converts. Unfortunately, what Westernized Muslims want to believe, and what Muslims in the West say about Islam, has never been an authoritative source of Islamic law or theology. Islamic law and theology are derived from the teachings of Muhammad. And in this case, at least, the teachings of Muhammad are perfectly clear. Next up in our series, Surah 9, verse 5, commands Muslims to slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Sounds violent. Can context rescue this verse? Stay tuned. Don't, 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 don't.